I, now I just want to know if he if he's saying because I will be like my pants will be blown off my body. <laughs> <laughs> Brunch, hit it, boys. <laughs> Tomato fights two. It's a battle of 86s. The sixth sense versus Chicago. Pete, we got Sean Evans in the damn house of Hot Ones fame. What's up, Sean? Hey, what's going on, guys? Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. This is about like five years in the making at this point, honestly. I think yeah. in, in like 2016, I reached out and I was like, hey, you want to come on my podcast? And you're like, hell yeah, let's do it. And we were like, Except very it. cool. All done and, then with three, this now. and then three years later, there's a DM. Four years later, there's a DM like, uh, hey, how about now? Like, all right, good. So uh, the Cosmos lined up and Pete, we finally made it happen. That's right. And like, I don't, I really want to make it clear that you are not the asshole in this situation. You said yes every time. And it was just me being like, very cool. There's and been like never responded. different ideas where we're like, let's do this. Let's do this. And Pete's like, I think Sean Evans would be down. Let's do it. And I'm like, oh yeah, we're getting Sean Evans for this. Fuck. Yeah. So there's been like several different times where we've just assumed, all right, cool. We're going to do this thing. And we had to wait for tomato fights, I guess. We had, for Chicago and the sixth sense to come together to bring us together. The first question we ask on tomato fights is, uh, what do you think of the, this concept for a podcast? I actually, I, I love it. And then here, uh, this is not to gas you guys too much, but like I was telling some other people that I'm going on this podcast and like, oh, what's the podcast? And they're like, oh, well, they take two movies that have the exact same Rotten Tomatoes score. And then it's kind of a debate about which movie is better. And a hundred percent of the time people are like, Whoa, that's a cool idea. That's no. a good podcast. That's a great idea. So not to gas you guys up so much, but so far it's been a uh, very positive on sort of the, uh, the feedback, the blind feedback. It's, it's more positive. of a burden though, that we're the ones that have to execute it. Like <laughs> there was a lot of excitement over the idea. And then like knowing that, so like, like Shyamalan, when he made the sixth sense, he insisted, if you're buying this movie, I'm directing it. And he was probably really all excited about it. I think that we would have just as soon sold it to people. Like, do you want to buy it? Like, you you want do, do <laughs> right. you want to do it yourself? It may, like, you can make it a huge thing. I feel like. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I I'm a hundred percent with you on that. So I I guess it's just uh I but I guess the the thing about it is just uh is just seeing how it all melds together and then just executing against it. But I was thinking the exact same thing because like from your guys' side of the table, it's like, what if you get a guest that was just like. Uh, I don't know. They're both like pretty good or whatever. And then you guys have to carry that whole thing. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that it's, we like carrying it though. Like if yeah, the guest doesn't yeah. want to pick oh, shit yeah. up, yeah. we'll take yeah. it. We'll just turn it into a podcast. Yeah. Hell yeah. I, but I always feel like that is like, you know, sometimes people ask me like, do you like being a guest or like a host or like what is, and I'm always like, well, I like hosting because um the responsibility of keeping the ball in the air is on me. But then when I'm a guest, I always feel this like, weird uh sense that like it's up to me to keep the ball in the air on something like that so so i'm happy to finally hand the reins over to somebody else oh yeah i mean th there's no worse feeling than when you feel like you're not getting something out of an interview or if you are being interviewed and you feel like the interviewer is either nervous or whatever and like isn't like really leading you places so then you kind of need to steer it and then you I, in the back of my yeah. head i'm like Whoever's listening to this probably thinks that I'm a dick because it's, <laughs> I'm just like hijacking it. Now I'm asking them questions because I know what you're saying though. Like there's like that nervous energy of you want it humming no matter who's, who's leading it. I mean, Pete and I, worst case, we'll happily just fucking talk to each other in front of people. <laughs> yeah. would, That's how the podcast started. We were just talking to each not. other in front of people and they were like, just, can you, can we not do this? You just get a podcast. Yeah. Stop doing this in front of me. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hell yeah. I, I understand. I feel that. And I, I feel that in my soul. I, I understand what you guys are saying a hundred percent right there. I intentionally didn't look this up. Speaking of good interviewing skills, I intentionally did not look this up. Has anyone from either of these movies, the sixth sense or Chicago been on hot ones? 
No, you know, I was watching it through and there are some heavy hitters, you know, from Renee Zellweger to Catherine Zeta Jones. And, and you look through all of this whole thing and I, and I was thinking the exact same thing and Richard Gere and all these different people that are in these movies. And I was like, no, I, I think that we're like, oh, for Haley Joel Osment. Like, I think we're oh, for on like every single person. So I'm going in this with uh, with no sense of loyalty to anybody. Uh, I'm completely objective going into this whole thing because I've not interviewed anybody from either of these movies. Outside of the fact that you are from Chicago and one of these movies is Chicago. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. And you know what? I did find myself um, attached to Chicago in certain ways when when they show, you know, like the... And, and what was funny is I was watching Chicago on Amazon Prime and they have this sort of like running thing that you can keep open on the left side of the browser where they have almost like a pop-up video quality to it where they like just keep feeding you with like fun facts about whoever's on screen or like continuity errors in the movie and everything and i found myself like what and i was like oh so this was like a show that that started as like sort of a meta broad like in the chicago theater sort of broadway experience and i was like oh that's like super cool and then they would show shots of chicago and like chicago is such a spectacle in its movie and i would see the way that they did the bridges in chicago and found myself on a sentimental sort of being from their level connecting to the movie in a way that may have skewed my bias but i guess we'll see so let's start with Chicago then, because I had the same experience, Sean. I was watching on the Amazon thing, and one of our favorite things to do is find a fun fact about anything. Like, we did an episode about Jaws, and it ended up being just three episodes about how we learned that the original director got fired because he kept calling the shark a whale. Like, so little <laughs> things like that can just kind of take over. I don't know if you saw this on the Amazon fun facts thing because I did. And that's just taken over my last couple of days. There was a battle between the agents of Renee Zellweger yeah, and yeah, Catherine yeah. Zeta-Jones yeah. name placement on the poster. And but yeah. before, so Pete, it, as Sean knows the, the end of this, you don't, who would you have given the poster to? Uh, at that point, probably... Zellweger I, I would say Zellweger yeah. I thought that right like she seemed like the star of that movie right yeah all right so I, I love this question because I was that to me was the most interesting fun fact that rolled up on the left is that the agents got involved in this sort of back and forth on who got top building uh, who got top building Renee Zellweger Catherine Zeta-Jones and here's what I think is like Catherine Zeta-Jones has such command over that role in Chicago. Like it really feels like her movie. It sounds like it sounds like when they were making the movie that Catherine Zeta-Jones was the first person that they had in mind. And even there are other fun facts about them wanting uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones to play Roxy in Chicago. Mm. There was even like all of that stuff. So it sounds like Chicago and Catherine Zeta-Jones were like connected from the jump when they were taking it to studios and pitching the script and everything. It sounded like that was like a combined deal with them, um, which leads me to believe then like maybe, you know, knowing how agents fight about this sort of thing, um, leading me to believe that like Catherine Zeta-Jones maybe should have had pole position as being a front runner in that. But another, my second favorite fun fact that rolled up on the left side was that Renee Zellweger had zero dancing, zero singing training, zero anything. She kind of went into that blind. And that was shocking to me because she was so amazing in her performance. So like to her, for her to take three months of singing and performance training and turning it into the performance that she had, that movie's nothing without Renee Zellweger's performance in it. So that leads me to believe that maybe she jumps a little bit but like i know how agents fight and i bet if you got captain zeta jones and renee zellweger in the room uh neither one of them would care or would defer to each other but agents are, are vampires in this town you know what i mean <laughs> like that they'll have that war because they're acting uh for themselves not necessarily uh for whatever wishes that they had in mind but uh they're both amazing in it uh, but to me, that was like a interesting fun fact because it's a coin flip. I feel like they made that movie with Catherine Zeta-Jones as being the uh, 
connection to it, the thing that made that into a thing. So maybe she deserves that top billing. But uh, Renee's performance in it maybe jumps it because she was just so amazing in that movie. I, so, th- I think it honestly kind of like serves the movie to have that fight because they, yeah. they oh, fight yeah. in the movie and they want they want the, the bigger stardom. So like the fact that, that versus happens, Burnett, like down to the whole thing, it's like, like it's art it, imitating art imitates life like it was yeah, pretty. It's so meta. It's yeah. so meta. And I, I love what the solution ended up being. They went with diagonal billing, meaning if you look at it on the left, it's Ka- it says Catherine Zeta Jones, but on the right, Renee Zellweger is higher. And then in the middle, it says Richard Gere. So you look at it and <laughs> I try, I, I was like doing the Pepsi challenge with myself. I would, I would look at it, then like walk away, look at some other shit and like, <laughs> then pull it up and be like, what do I see first here? And it's a fucking mind fuck because initially I was like, wow, Catherine Zeta-Jones absolutely won that because you read left to right. Yeah. But I mean, top to bottom, it, it's pretty fascinating. <laughs> so that's the best part of the movie. All done. Now we'll talk about Sixth Sense. <laughs> uh, no, uh, to borrow a line though from the Sixth Sense, uh, did you think the play sucked big time? I'll say <laughs> I fucking love this. I, I loved Chicago. I had never seen the play before. Obviously, this is from the 1975 play. I'd heard a few of the songs before, but I knew very little about this, and I was crazy about it. Sean, completely agree with you on the performances. I thought that even though Gear, I would probably also guess, doesn't have a ton of experience <laughs> yeah. in musical theater. The voice matching with Gear on like the dubbing yeah. was hilarious. It was like this old timey, like 1940s guy, and yeah. it's like Richard Gear, and I was, this is tough. Wait, so oh. do you think? Do you think it was he, it was not him singing that? No, definitely not. Right? I would be stunned if that was Richard Gear's voice. Well, but you know what? I saw another fun fact. You know these fun facts. I think this like. This experience of being on this podcast, I think, will forever change the way that I do hot ones because I didn't even realize that wow. Amazon does these sort of like fun fact roles on this. And oh, they were yeah. saying that like Richard Gere is this trained, like amazing pianist. So maybe he does have, and that he did that whole scene and like Pretty Woman and stuff, like all by himself. So like maybe he does have this like musical theater background that we're not even aware of. Okay. Yeah. So Richard Gere. Won a Golden Globe for Best Actor in a Motion Picture, Musical or Comedy for this role. Okay. That to me, I mean, I know that Rami Malek won a bunch of shit for the Freddie Mercury thing and he wasn't singing those songs, but I don't think they're just giving Gear a globe if he's, he's got not something. singing those. He's got that magic. He's got that he, magic. You know, but he doesn't really care for the, the awards or anything. All he cares about is love. I learned that in a song. This movie. <laughs> very cool uh i now i just want to know if he if he sang because i'll be like my pants will be blown off my body if, <laughs> the, <laughs> if he sang in that movie the next tomato fights is going to have richard gear as the third panelist and yeah. we're just gonna be like all right first couple of questions then just make it like a 60 minute conversation about whether or not he sang in uh in chicago and if he's like oh no that was me i'll be like look dude Malik, is, did, Ma- Malik didn't do it in Bohemian Rhapsody. No one's going to judge you. They man. can't you take can it back. It. You already got it. You can just the wonders didn't sing. That was that was that was Mike Viola. Like you can just I say, can, I can't wait for that episode. Hold his feet to the fire. That's yeah, right. we're pretty tough on gear on this uh, on this <laughs> podcast. We uh, we don't go easy on him like everybody else. Um, but yeah, Sean, uh, what, what were your thoughts on this movie and play? Because like I said, I, I thought this was a blast. And what was your exposure yeah. to it before this? Oh, true. All right. so that, the, both of those are good questions. So uh, to me, um, you know, like through doing the show, through doing Hot Ones, like, you know, I'm always walking a mile in somebody else's shoes and it exposes me to all of these different things, like all of these different qualities about people, the different art, the different movies, the different books, the different albums and everything. Um, so, uh, like I wouldn't necessarily like pull off the blockbuster shelf Chicago to watch in my free time. Uh, but I like the opportunity like this to expose myself to art that I otherwise wouldn't just reach for impulsively. And so, uh, when I first started watching it, like I was actually in because I, I love the razzmatazz of it all, you know, the pace of it all, the drama of it all, the spectacle of it all. And then sometimes, you know, like after 30 minutes of show tunes, you can get kind of exhausted. You know what I mean? Like you can, you get to like the fourth song. It's like, 
and you'll feel like you ate like a whole pound of brisket or something. You know what I mean? Like, it was like, I need a nap. Um, but the thing that held me is that like, it always had these like dramatic spikes in it. Like no matter where it went, like in every act, like when you think it's reached its, uh, when you think it's reached its climax, it has like another thing, like even in the courtroom, like when she's acquitted and then there's like a shooting outside and then like all the photographers leave and they're just like no pictures. And like the whole movie is like that. So it's like this exhaustive experience of going through it. But then at the end of it all, you're like, wow you know, that was an amazing ride. And that was my experience of Chicago where it was just like, uh, um, I'm a spectacle guy. I'm like a eat a half an edible and watch a movie kind of guy. And like, and, and that's what I did. That was, I think the ideal viewer experience for something like Chicago. And I found myself on the other end of it thinking in my head, you know, having seen six Sense, six Sense a bunch of times, never seen Chicago. I'm like, I don't know if this matchup's gonna work because Sixth Sense is a classic. Like there's nothing that's gonna dunk over Sixth Sense. But then after I watched Chicago, I was like, wow, that was an amazing viewer experience. And then that's where it leaves the, the coin flip debate that this podcast is meant for, um, you know, and, and why they both got an 86%. And I think uh, that's where I'm at. I, I really liked it. And I, I think that I really liked it more from like a technical perspective than anything because i mean the presentation of it was incredible like some of the shots were unbelievable uh the costumes were great and i think the thing that i like the most about it is that when you watch it from home it still kind of feels like you're watching a play and i thought that was kind of amazing like yeah. they had like i think the, the like lighting helped a lot where there was a lot of stuff where it kind of felt like you were watching like nothing, nothing in the background, like complete blackness. And it was only being lit like the stage, like the center subjects on stage were being lit. That stuff was really, really cool to me. So the the fact that they were able to do like uh, a no, movie. Thank you. I'm good. Sorry. No worries. Sorry. The fact that they were able to do a movie about a play and then like serve that part of it and then also present it as a play, I think was really, really yeah, cool. Yeah, I think that and there have obviously been a lot of like, plays on screen that have come out the last few years and no disrespect to any of those but i watched this and i think this is probably the best use of putting of like combining the movie experience with the play experience because you definitely if you're walking by somebody watching this you're like all right they're watching a, a play there you could tell that it's a, a that it's a theatrical production but it still has like the the craziness and the intensity of of a movie yeah. I was, yeah, go ahead. I felt that a hundred percent. Like I felt the viewer experience of it was like being at the theater. You know, the, the mm -hmm. drama of it all, it was like being at the theater, the emotional roller coaster of it all. And then just the way that it uh, fills your soul, the show tune quality of filling your soul was everything um, that you'd expect from like a theater experience. So, and I don't think that's easy. I don't think that's easy to translate the stage show, the Broadway success uh, to film necessarily. But Chicago, you can't, it's undeniable the, the way that it brought that to the, to the movie screen. So you, you had not seen the, the play before? I would not seen the play, not seen the play before, not seen the play before. And did either of you know, I, I was thinking, I actually realized it was because in chorus in high school, we sang a couple of songs, but I was like, I know some of these songs, but I wonder like, does the average per like the average person who hasn't seen greece probably knows a few songs from greece or something yeah. but right. are these songs like so ubiquitous with like the average person that did you like w was any of this familiar to you guys i mean like some of it sounded familiar but i it wasn't like i was like oh this is from chicago yeah like it just right. felt like i had heard it before yeah even like the opening was it like even the opening song i didn't think was like from chicago but i'd heard it before Oh, uh, all that jazz. Yeah. All that jazz. You know yeah. what I mean? Like everybody's heard that, like all that jazz you <laughs> right. know, before. And I didn't know that that was from Chicago, but that's like immediately what kind of just hooks you in because it's the first scene of the entire movie. A real technical question about this movie. Uh, have we no choice but to Stan Amos? Because he is just the sweetest little <laughs> cuck I have ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> He really is. Oh, God bless him. And like there there's like a point in the movie where they they like they tease you that he like he might grow a set of balls when he's like, wait, mm -hmm. she's she's playing me and, and he gets all angry. And then like two seconds later, he's just like, just give it a but, second. But, but I'll lay down so she can step all over me again. That's fine. I mean, no, when, no, that... he, 
when he was singing Mr. Cellophane, I was like, like I was like getting down to that shit. I was I was just all in on Amos just getting his ass kicked the entire movie. And you're right, there are a couple of moments, especially in the beginning, when he's taking the fall for this murder that she committed. Side note, I had no idea there was so much murder in this play it, the second it's, it started, I, I was like I did not know it's whoa murder it's right about off murder bat. didn't yeah. know it was the like bodies murder. hit the floor yes. the bodies yes. hit the floor of this murder one. heavy movie but when he's taking the fall for her murder and then realizes wait a second she was stripping the furniture guy i probably shouldn't like go to jail for this woman and then is like you know what i'm actually not going to take the fall for this person's murder she calls him she gets upset and calls him a blabbermouth <laughs> <laughs> Like, he's a bad guy for not letting her just murder somebody. She's supposed to stick to the plan. Yeah, this was going to so, work perfectly for me, dude. <laughs> there are, like, four scenes like that because, all right, so the first one is, and and then, two, like, the whole thing that they're holding against him is that he spends too much time working. She's like, you know, he spends 14 hours working. You know what I mean? Like, that that's the whole thing that she holds against this guy. But then he walks in. He, he takes the, like, he walks in, just sees a body on the floor, takes a rap for that whole thing, and then finds out that she was cheating on him and is like, wait a second, I recant everything. I didn't know that she was cheating on me. Then there's that time that he's in jail and there's like another song in the middle where she's like singing, but then like it's juxtaposed with him being like, I get no attention. You know what I mean? And then yeah. it goes to trial and then it goes well, to Before trial. that, he pays like commits to paying five thousand dollars or he pays two thousand dollars yeah, yeah. For this lawyer and then in the trial they play him again with this fake pregnancy and then like when he finds out that he might be the mother of this child he falls back in but then that's all a joke on him too because that was just a ploy to like win over the jury so john c Riley, it's just non-stop him getting dunked on this yeah. whole movie so I, everybody too even the lawyer was like dude yeah. can you do math Please do math. Yeah. This is not your child. Uh, and you know that all of these shots are going to come at his character. But at the end, when she gets off and he's like, hey, we get to start anew now. I'm like, oh, I forgot there's one last yeah, fucking dummy coming. And she's yeah. like, dude, fucking figure it out, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm and she says that, like, who do you think I am? Like, blah, blah, blah. What are you, a dumbass? She's like, and she's like driving the knife in further. Like, I don't think I don't think I've ever seen a character more kicked down than John C. Riley in this movie. I would take a sequel of just watching his character, like, figure it out and how his life was just the saddest thing ever. Yeah. I mean, tell you what, I mean, if we're giving out Golden Globes to gear for that performance, I don't hate the idea of tossing like a best supporting at John, John C. Riley for that movie. 100%. I mean, he smoked what his performance. I did yeah, out of the and I did not know what to expect. I I knew it's insane how little I knew about this movie. But I told people that we were doing this movie next. They were like, "Oh man, loaded!" And I was like, "Yeah, that's right." And I only knew Catherine Zeta Jones was in it, and I just couldn't place everybody else. And somebody mentioned John C. Riley. I was like, "What the hell does John C. Riley do in this movie?" But <laughs> he killed it. All the all the performances, though, I thought were great. We had Maya in the mix. It yep. was uh, Queen Latifah was great. Although complain about Queen Latifah's character, the song introducing her reveals that everybody in that prison, whether you are a guard, warden, or prisoner, dresses like the exact same. So it's tough to differentiate them, especially when. All of them also sing. Like if it was just like, all right, the prisoners <laughs> right. are singing. Like they are all singing and dancing, like going in and out. I can look past the fact that they're able to get all their costumes in there, and that somebody is doing Catherine Zeta Jones's hair and makeup every day. <laughs> every day, she yeah. looks fucking incredible in prison. But I needed something like b- different clothing, whatever, to let me know who people are in that. My movie. biggest problem with the uh, the Queen Latifah intro sequence was that. Before they they like they like tease it as like this big like ooh who could this be and they have her walk by like um like a, a window and it's like a silhouette and just like the second that I saw the silhouette I was like oh god that's Queen Latifah for sure yeah. like th- she has the most identifiable like silhouette I think I've ever seen <laughs> okay <laughs> not in like not I, in I a bad like way I... just like that is a hundred percent Queen yeah, Latifah yeah my, my reaction was. I didn't know that, but I bet if I if we were to like watch it again, I would catch that. Like you know how you pointed out. Have you ever seen like Pokemon 
where they're like, oh, yeah, like back in the day, they used to do like the commercial before they come back from a commercial. They'd be like, who is that Pokemon? It's just a silhouette. I smoke those. Those are so fucking easy. I would crush Queen Latifah every single time. Be like <laughs> Queen Latifah, very easy. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, So uh, Baranski's also in. This. Oh, yeah. Didn't know that. And Baranski, I believe, doesn't even sing. That's a real she does like, a little bit. OK, like, very briefly. Real fake out to get Baranski in your musical and be like, we don't. It's like having John Hamm do the voiceovers for Mercedes. They're like, we're going to use John Hamm. Well, we're not even going to use the face. Yeah, I'm going to tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I like that. It's like um, it's like if you have it's like reverse clickbait or something. You know what I mean? Like it's it, it's, it's something that makes me respect it even more. It's it's better to have uh better to have it that way than like do a bait and switch where you're like we yep. got this person and then you don't really make them do anything. Uh, Dominic Dominic West I thought was gonna be a thing in this movie because again I I knew that all these big actors were gonna be coming in. He has about 13 seconds in the movie. He serves to stup Roxy's character and then break up her with her with the definitely don't try this at home but the greatest breakup line i've ever heard in my life which is we had some laughs let's just leave it at that <laughs> yeah. yeah that seems great when he's like walking out and she's like planning the rest of their life and he's just like he's rushing to just put on his tie and stuff and then ends up just like shoving her against the wall and it's like we yeah. had some laughs leave it at that i work at a furniture store i didn't even know the manager i'm out of here you know yeah. and then it's shot in the chest turns turns violent real quick like I'm a, yeah, she's like, like hey he the most violent post nut clarity ever yeah <laughs> he's just a completely different person he's just like are you kidding me everything that comes out of her mouth he's like are you joking are you serious how do you think this is real so that was the point at which i'm like all right this is funny it's obviously mean to this character but it's funny that he's like you you can tell that happens in every movie where like Afterwards, someone's like scurrying, trying to get away and like they feel different. Something has changed. And he says that we had some laughs. Let's just leave it at that. I'm like, oh, this is a hilarious character. And then she's <laughs> like, well, what do you mean? And then he throws her against a wall. And I was like, I, get, I, I still don't know what this movie is about, but I'm confused so far. And I, then I guess it was cleared up when she murdered him right after. And, and I'm then, stealing that line. I'm stealing that line. Yeah, we, we had, had some laughs. laughs. Let's just leave it at that. But you can't say it in like 2021 Sean Evans voice. You got to say it in 1924. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah, I got to I got to take it back. Hey, baby. Look, kid. Doll. Hey, baby doll. We had some laughs. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> He's going to be that would be the most hilarious character. Again, another like kids don't try this at home, but that would be the most hilarious like character to slip into. <laughs> which is just like the 1924 dumper. Oh, come on, sweetheart. I couldn't. You can have my, my dame. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> uh, they also, this is also a very 20s thing. When they interrogate uh, Amos and Roxy, they do it using uh, just a flashlight. Yeah. Just All they're, pointing straight just the the, they're yeah. like, you, you, you thought you had a story prepared? Good luck with it now <laughs> because we're lighting the room slightly better. Yeah, like whatever happened to that? Like, remember when we were kids, like in cartoons or something, there'd always be like that, like swinging light oh, in the yeah. interrogation yeah. room. And that's what's like, that was what's supposed to make the walls close in on you. You know, yeah, like it would just be the person's the longest trope. Yeah. Yeah. The person sitting at the uh, at the table with like either the, like the swinging lamp or like the desk lamp and the desk lamp's just pointed straight at their face. Yeah. I believe I think that uh, does Rappaport hit uh phoebes with that when they're when they're looking for an apartment and she lies and says there are no apartments in new york available because she doesn't want to move in with them and there's i think they're in an interrogation room because she's visiting him at work and he does he like grabs the swinging light and <laughs> throws it in her face i don't think i don't think i bet people don't do that anymore that's not think. the that's not the truth serum that it's represented as in uh no. in classic cinema I think they came to learn. They were like, you know what? Like light probably isn't going to change this. I don't think <laughs> people aren't intimidated by, by light. Um, I don't know what came out between first between this and Moulin Rouge. I think they probably came out around the same time. My guess would be Moulin Rouge maybe. Uh, but I'll say like tired, the Moulin, the Lady Marmalade music video, because that was like the big like burlesque sexy yeah. thing that like kids freaked out over wired 
the he had it coming song oh, scene yeah. with all those girls i was like what the fuck was i doing watching moulin <laughs> rouge when i was a, i didn't see that movie but like watching lady marmalade video this was where it was I mean, at. I mean, if you were watching that though, you might grow up with like a like a lifelong fear that just every woman is going to Gonna kill murder you. you. Yes, <laughs> because that was a very frightening scene. I mean, they killed, they took bodies over uh, someone chewing gum, yeah. over uh, yeah, because well, they were popping the gum to be yeah, fair. yeah, blowing bubbles. In fairness, they were blow, they were popping the gum to be fair. That can get annoying. And he did get a warning. Yeah, but it was <laughs> fired at him. No, but there was a warning before the warning shot oh right she says i told him if you do pop it one, it one more, time. more time so then he popped and i fired two warning shots into In his, his motherfucking chest yeah like <laughs> jesus this is th again this movie if you don't know what it's about is, is on some gangster shit you would not expect is this rated r um i think it's pg-13 let's let's this do a far too much murder in this movie for it to be pg-13 it is um tell you what wikipedia should put the rating on the right side. It's yeah. given me all this information. I know that's production companies, but I don't know what it's rated. Hold on. I'm going to do a control. Well, while lap. you look at that, I'll wind up this little thing. What I thought was interesting about that is, you know, they had like, if it was a stabbing or a shooting, they'd have the red ribbon. That was very cool. Representing yeah. the blood. Yeah. And then for the woman who claimed that she was innocent, they did red for everybody, but they did white mm -hmm. for her to represent that like she probably was innocent of like whatever crime that she did and then speaking of murder she ends up getting hanged later on in the movie but it's like i i did i did think that that was kind of beautiful how they had the red ribbon like i mean the, ultimately it's like even if you're the biggest hater in the world and even you're like ah show tunes like blah 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 blah, blah you have to respect the artistry with which these things are put together from time to time you know what i mean like even if it's not your genre when i looked at that i was like wow that took some coordination that took some choreography that took like a whole weekend of somebody figuring something out uh so i thought that was like i thought that was really beautiful totally the movie is rated pg-13 mm -hmm. and uh i guess the two movies where red is a yes. very important color yeah. that we're dealing with we're getting a lot of crossover so far this is sean the second straight or i guess 100 percent of the tomato fights episodes have involved renee zellweger so we're going to like keep a chart of things that keep popping up because so, we did Jerry Maguire last time. There we go. We got Zellweger this time. And now we got two movies with the uh, with Red playing yeah. a, a big role. And two two straight weeks with uh, with like basically an angry divorced wives club. That's true. <laughs> but this is the first one that involves murder. This is a way more homicidal <laughs> yes. divorced wives club. Uh, so it was popping the gum. My favorite one was uh, Maya who said, I loved uh, his name Lipschitz, I think. She's like, I love this man with every fiber of my being. But one day he asked me if I was screwing the milkman. So yeah. I killed him. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> Jesus. that's an insane reaction. <laughs> Well, yeah, zero you might have been screwing yeah. the milkman. That, it that sounds sort of like reaction were... makes it seem like you were screwing yeah, the milkman. Yeah, it sounds man. like you were screwing the milkman. So, uh, you know what? I'll tell you what. I'm team husband on this <laughs> yeah. one. I don't think he did Guilty anything Guilty of wrong. two things, I think. They I did kind of run the gamut, though. And again, like none of these guys deserve to be murdered. But the first one is, this motherfucker was blowing bubbles. The other one was, he was married to more people than me. Yes. I'm like, oh, well, like I see. Again, I'm not excusing it, but I could see how somebody would get upset about that. And it, then like, he said he was Mormon. So it's like legal for him. Yeah, there. He did it, lie about it. Yeah, unfortunately. it really. But I'll disagree with the song. I will not say he had it coming and that <laughs> he only had himself to blame. I don't know about you guys. I've had all these songs stuck in my head since I saw the movie. Uh, he had it coming stuck with me for a little bit. Good one. Yeah, a... yeah, he had it coming and all that jazz. Like, even after we leave the podcast today, I'll still be humming that for the rest of the day, probably. And the... tomorrow. The one for me, I don't know why. Mr. Cellophane really, like, struck a chord with me. <laughs> Maybe it's just because I didn't expect to see John C. Riley singing. But he's got, like, those slow moves. He's kind of, he's making himself look like, I think he's trying to look like a hobo. But he's also quite looking like a clown. Well, he dressed like a clown. Yeah, pretty That's sure he dressed he's like got, a clown. Like, clown yeah. makeup going on. I was like, I was wondering. I was like, how how didn't people jump on this with the uh like the Joker memes? Yeah, it's uh, John C. Riley putting on the. We'll on the clown do that. Makeup. We'll do some like crossover <laughs> Joker memes or whatever. But I mean, in this day and age of everyone's talking about, is it sad boy season? Is it sad girl season? Uh, Adele ripping off Feidelberg, Taylor Swift ripping off Feidelberg. Everybody doing all this like sad boy, sad girl <laughs> stuff. 
I'm going to text Feidelberg after this and be like, dude, I've got a song because he has a playlist <laughs> for sa- like sad boy songs. You've got Mr. Add- Cellophane is number one. W- that is like big sad boy energy. Yeah, you might as well be wearing like a kick me sign while singing that song. <laughs> He's like the most pathetic guy in the world in that song. Yeah, I'll tell you, I just I don't know. That's just my guy. I, I, re- I really like him. I respect him owning it. But he's he's literally like, oh, I am the worst. I'm the saddest boy in the world. And that's what's cool. He's not like, how come everyone's kicking me? He <laughs> says, my parents should have fucking named me Mr. Cellophane. He is like <laughs> on board with like, I am invisible. He's not asking, why am I invisible? He's not asking, how come this guy gets all the girls and I don't or whatever? He's just like, yo, you people need to know how it is. Yeah. I don't fucking matter, okay? <laughs> and I know it. <laughs> I love it. God. Um, also, shout out Roxy when uh, another star murderer comes along, played by Lucy Liu, uh, and takes Roxy's spotlight. She pulls a Kelly Kapoor and just screams that she's pregnant. And everyone's <laughs> like, okay, this is the, what the movie's about now. Yeah. I, you know what? I think maybe, too, the other reason that I connected to the film is because it is such a a satirical lens through which to view fame that I actually think ages quite well into Mm. the internet era. Um, So that was like another reason that I, I, it's another reason that the movie gave me to care about it um, was that whole like, oh no, like the camera's not on me. I have to do something bigger and more extreme. And I think that's even something that you see more of now than ever before. And so I think like even the themes of Chicago are something that, you know, you take it all the way back to the, the thirties and shit when it started as a play into now. And I think the themes resonate more now than they ever have. Yeah. I again, I, I this is a, a well earned eighty six in my book. This yeah, is yeah. A hard. Yeah. No arguments, no arguments there. Like, uh, you know, sometimes you see with Rotten Tomatoes where like the critic score is like ninety five and the audience score is like twenty five. That's always a movie that I never want to see. This one though, it's like eighty six. Like, I, I'm sure that the audience score is like right up with there, and it definitely deserves it. So we do a thing called brunch score, which is the difference between a low Rotten Tomatoes score and a high audience score because that's the shit we want. We want a yeah, movie that's, that's, where I'm, like a I'm, critic I'm a sees it. I love that shit yeah, too. Where a critic sees it is like, well, that was fucking stupid. And the audience saw something in it. So we're like, <laughs> let's do that. And it's a, a lot of that's like action movies. Um, horror and, movies. Yeah, horror, horror movies, movies a lot for sure. Too. Yeah, what do you think? To, you know what? I have some theories on like horror movies and Rotten Tomatoes and the way that they get scored. I, I think that horror movies get a lower score, even the good ones, because I think when people are scared or frightened, they don't necessarily associate that with like being good. And so I always think that horror movies are on a lower scale than mm. any other genre of movie because they like scare people. So I always think that I always I always add a, a 10 or 15. I always think that horror movies are on a curve that's different from any other genre yeah. um, that's unique to Rotten Tomatoes. But I always I always add 10 or 15 to every horror movie score because I think sometimes critics put it down or even the audience put it down because they were scared and that's what left a bad taste in their mouth. And that's why they regard it as like being not good or good or whatever. But that's what I'm looking for. So I always, I always, I always give a horror movie bump. I also think that horror movies, a lot of the time, like they get bumped down for like performances and campiness. And like a lot of the time that shit is intentional. Yeah. Like they're going. Yeah. That, yeah. And like, that's, that's, they kind of want to mix the horror with silliness and the silliness is perceived as being bad. So, you know, I, I think that the, the intended tone gets missed a lot when it comes to horror reviews and that that sort of affects what critics think. Do you remember when, when Happy Death Day yeah. came out, Pete saw it and I loved it. And Pete was like, yeah, it's OK. Like, I don't know. It was like a little weird. Didn't totally get it. Then we were talking and Pete said he'd never seen Scream before. So the next day, Pete watched Scream, got like the campiness the of like the slash, yeah. the, like slasher films and was like, OK, I'm going back and seeing this because like critics do i totally agree with you pete critics miss like the uh you could see oh well they just made that character very like one-dimensional it's like yes because they're (laughs) chum they're waiting to get (laughs) to get eaten up um by the way uh an 83 audience score okay so airtight 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 the margin of error is right there do we have any other thoughts on Chicago before we move on to uh, the Sixth Sense? 
I guess my my thing that I was going to ask, I guess Sean answered this a little bit earlier, but I was like, outside of them just like mentioning that they're in Chicago a few times. I yeah, was like, okay. What what else about this movie makes it Chicago? Am I, am I missing anything? But it, it seemed like this could have taken place anywhere. I mean, Gear outside. does attribute a lot of things in this movie to, well, that's Chicago. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> that sounds like lawyer speak. So like somebody will like slip and like fall down the stairs or whatever. He's like, ah, classic Chicago. Yeah, it's, I'm like, eh. And it's like not helping like the murder uh, aspect of like the perception of Chicago because <laughs> there's just like a bunch of murder and they're like, Oh, well, that's Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I, uh, Pete, I think that's actually a great observation because like when I was watching it, I was expecting to see a lot of, you know, because 1920 Chicago is amazing. There's so many buildings on the river that were like built in the 1920s and like the way that would look or like the Wrigley building, carbide and carbon. Like I was kind of like looking for all those things in the river and that's sort of like art deco era that was in Chicago. And I'm not sure that that was necessarily represented in the movie the way that I expected it to be. You have a lot of scenes that are like in a theater setting, in a jail setting, in a courtroom setting, but it doesn't take you into sh- Chicago, I guess, as much as I was expecting and in a way that would probably draw me in more to the film. Not to say that like movies should be tailor made to whatever sensibilities that I have going into them and I haven't seen them or anything. I never have that sort of sense of entitlement when I watch something. But but I agree with you. Like I, I didn't think that that was like a distinctly Chicago setting or a distinctly Chicago tone that would make uh, a movie that's named Chicago necessarily scream Chicago, if that makes sense. I wish they like afflected it and like forced landmarks <laughs> into it. So yeah. like people for like when you watch a Ben Affleck movie, you're like, oh, I, that's whatever. Like I've been there before. And you're like high fiving all of like your Ben Affleck. I killed him at the you. bean, you see. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. If they were like, oh, <laughs> Let's just go to Millennium Park and you know what? Just, we're we're going to grab, hold on. Do you have $5,000? Well, I'll take a dog from Portillo's. And you're like, yeah. oh yeah, like in Chicago. Yeah. It didn't have many of, it didn't, it didn't connect that many dots in that way or as many as I'd expect them to, to be honest. And I was looking for them. Like I walked in yeah. looking for that. Like if you missed two scenes and the name of the movie, you'd be like, this could take place anywhere. I but, I also th- but I also think that like that, you mentioned like they omitted a lot of things in terms of like references to the city. But I also think that goes back to presenting it as a play and like the minimalistic approach they took to a lot of scenes and the way that they were uh, like the stage design and stuff. They didn't want, I feel like they didn't want to do that. And it kind of would have taken me out of it from, from that sense is like viewing it as, as a play. So much of it is on like literally on stage too. So like, unless it's in prison or in the courtroom, like that's kind of where everything is. Like they're not really, heading out you know right and too i guess like if i if i'm making something like that or if i'm producing something like that i guess i want to take the theater audience that loves the play and make them fall in love with the movie yeah i don't want to necessarily take like the guy who grew up around chicago and did architectural tours of the city and like and then make him fall in love with this show tune musical movie you know what i mean so so, so it's not a knock against anybody who made it, but I did go into that looking for those things, expecting those things and feeling. I guess my bigger question is, I guess my bigger question is, why do they name the play Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like there could have been a better name for just a, like a, a group of women who just all right. like killed their husbands. Yeah. There's way juicier shit <laughs> right. in this movie than like, the location. Like blood actresses or something would have been a very cool blood name actor. for us. Yeah, Save it's like what actresses, Pete. We gotta take that. We gotta shop that. Hell All yeah. that jazz, but like there's like blood dripping off one of the Z's or whatever, and you're like, oh, I bet there's more than just jazz in this. <laughs> that would be a poster, and then they could argue about uh who goes wearing it. So uh Wayne's World and the Fugitive will reign supreme in the Chicago movies that mention they're in Chicago. I could use like some, some Stan Makita in, in this movie. Loved it though. <laughs> Loved it, though. Strong film. Uh, less questions about the name of The Sixth Sense. Yeah, you get it there. <laughs> yeah. That one <laughs> That one I understand. It's a sure. 1999 thriller from M. Night Shyamalan. It's the one with the twist. Listening at home and you don't know, it's, it's, it's that one. Uh, I'll say, like, right off the top, you said that you have seen this movie multiple times. This was the second time I've, I'd seen this movie. Wow. And I think... 
I realized it's kind of just like a one shot deal for me. Really? Once I once you know that once you know the twist, it's really tough to watch the the movie because it's, for me at least, it's just so it's ob- distracting. It's just yeah, so, so obvious. Yes. Like the scene at yeah. the uh, when she's at the anniversary dinner. Yeah. Even when he's in the, the, I think his second scene with uh, the kid, where he's in the living room, yeah, and like the mother's talking to him, she leaves, and then he's sitting there. I'm like, yo, how did we not? <laughs> yeah. So my, how did we not know? Like, I think my biggest note from watching this was like, how big was the twist really? Because I think that even if I had seen this for the first time and I didn't know that there was like a big twist or whatever, I think that I would have arrived to it before it actually happened in the movie. Because yeah. it really seemed postmarked or, or telegraphed. And I don't know, that makes me feel like an asshole because obviously this is one of like the bigger twists in movie history. And it's basically like famous for that. And everybody went nuts over it. And it was a really good movie and a really good twist. But I think that they weren't all that subtle about it. Yeah, I think so too, especially when you watch it the next time around. So it's like, you know, Six cents. I don't know, like at what age I've seen these things. Like the first time I probably watched it, I was probably 10 years old. So like, what twist am I going to see coming? You know what I mean? Like, it's not like I'm going to watch it with that sense. But then I remember like, so it's been long enough to where I've for- forgotten most of the movie, but um, the twist was so profound that I recognized and understood that there was going to be that twist where he's dead the whole time. But then I was like, when he gets shot in that first scene, I was like, Oh yeah, that's right. He's dead the whole time. And like, that's where he gets killed. And, and then when you do know that twist, it does uh, corrode, corrupt uh, the movie going experience of that thing, because you do know it the whole time. It's not going to hit you in the heart. Like it does that first time you watch it. So upon watching it this time, I, I don't know if I had ever seen the initial scene where he's shot. I'd forgotten. So, so, yeah, same with me. I forgot it too. And it's like right like, out the gate. I think the twist would have been that much more of a heavy hitter had they not shown that on screen in the, in the very beginning. Um, and, and again, like this is this movie is whatever, like 25, 30 years old at this point. And like we can say, oh, I saw the twist coming because we've known about it for decades. But I just feel like it would have hit harder uh, had oh. they not shown it at the beginning. Yeah, th- my excitement in watching in rewatching this again, I, I came to the conclusion of like, oh, shit, I don't think this is going to hit as well for me it was more like half hour into the movie. But right when they showed that first scene, I was like, they fucking murder him in the <laughs> yeah. like, they we were so stupid. <laughs> yeah. He is shot to death. Not to death, but like he's shot in the first scene. How did we not see this coming? This is one of those situations where if that movie came out today, nobody would be nobody that the the twist the twist dynamic would last for like one day because as soon as somebody saw they put that, in like, the trailer, they'd say yeah. with a twist you'll never see coming. Or like every single review on Twitter would be like. Oh, and like, how about that crazy twist in the sixth sense? And then everybody would be looking for it and then they they'd know it immediately. Right. I yeah. I agree. Yeah. And that made me think, Pete, just that observation you made, like, uh, yeah, like the Twitter sort of reaction to it. I want. Yeah. Like what that impact would have been like in the 90s when that came out. Yeah. I mean, do you remember when Get Out came out? That's probably the best yeah. uh, example, because. I don't know if it's a twist as much as it is like it's a long time before you realize what the fuck is going on in that movie. And I was so horrified generally like uh, spoilers, whatever, if they happen, they happen. But I really, really, really didn't want anybody to know anything about that mm-hmm. movie until they saw it. And I think that it was, that was pretty well uh, observed, right? Like I, I don't think that people yeah. were like, yeah, blowing up get out to like fuck with people before they saw it so i don't know i i think that hopefully people would be nicer on twitter but i do think if but this it, came but out if today, you go in like, knowing that there's a twist right it's a lot easier to figure out in this movie than it would have been for a movie like get out where it's hidden really well and it's like actually a twist i remember the preview the trailer for the second um hostel i think they were like with a twist at the end you'll never see coming and I was like, well, first of all, <laughs> way too scared to see that movie. So I'm not seeing it. But second of all, it's like, not your job to tell us fuck? that. Yeah. yeah. Like if I if I were invested in that movie, I'd be so mad. Yeah. You just be because you just be like sniffing out the twist the whole time. And that ain't living. 
That's Dude. not living at all. That yeah, you want you want the twist to actually authentically hit you. Uh, a fun fact about this movie is that uh, let me see. Oh, okay. So we all know it's the Shyamalan. It's a movie that put Shyamalan on the map. Uh, he had done two movies to this point. One was like a small little thing in 1992. The other was a comedy. So no one's thinking of Shyamalan as Twisty McTwisterson. President of production of Walt Disney Studios, David Vogel, read the spec script, loved it, and without approval, dis- despite an ab- exorbitant price tag and the stipulation that Shyamalan has to direct, bought this movie for $3 million and immediately got fired for doing so. Really? Yeah. A guy really? lost his job because he saw, he like heard about Sixth Sense, was like, Oh my God, we got to do this. I, th- I think he, there was like a board he had to ask before he bought any movies. And I don't think movies were going for $3 million at that point. And he just like jumped on it, bought it. And they were like, what? What? Is it- wow. people not- Disney, fuck you. And they fired the guy. That you is what? More people need to hear his story because yeah, I, right? I, I, I love stories like that where like the creative mind, the artistic mind sees something through the fog. Uh, bets on it goes with it and then for this anonymous corporate entity to just rain hell down on him and then capitalize off the success of it later on right so uh, that leaves a sick taste in my mouth so they after they fired him they sold the production rights but they kept uh everything else and they had like some they're getting a percentage of whatever so disney i'm sure made fucking bank off this movie and this guy who really like the original Jaws director is now like on this list of he kind of was a big part of it, but we'll never fucking know. Well, I think this guy was more of a big part of it because he saw the brilliance in it. The other guy, he didn't see like, the bro. He thought it was a whale. He, did, he just saw the wrong animal. He thought it was a whale. <laughs> I think it would have changed the movie. Well, sure. you know what? I'm happy that we're having this conversation now in 2021 so that his legacy can live on because he deserves at least that. God damn it. Yeah. yeah, shout out, shout out David Vogel. Justice shout for, out David Vogel. for David Vogel. Another fun fact, Michael Sarah auditioned for the role of uh, of Cole. Really? Yeah. Oh, really? Wow. And I feel like, I don't know, I always thought that at some point Sarah was going to end up playing a weirdo. And I say that uh, lovingly of Haley Joel Osment. Uh, but I wouldn't think that Michael Sarah would, like, I, I figured like, 40 year old Michael Sarah is going to have to play like murderers and things like that. He's going to have to go like the Paul Dano route. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. Sarah as a kid. I'm glad that he didn't get that role. I, I, I like him in more of the, the goofy aloof. You know what? That, that when I watched that movie, uh, six cents, I don't think anybody could have done that. Like Haley Joel Osment. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it, it had to have been that and not, not to draw any, uh, parallels between the other, the other, um, episodes on this podcast but it's like when you do jerry Maguire, who is the kid in jerry Maguire? oh right ah uh, shit we jonathan lipnicki yes jonathan lipnicki jonathan lipnicki nobody could have done that like do you know how human head weighs eight pounds yeah. like nobody nobody could have done that other than that kid and then i could have done it I, no you pete <laughs> i would have nailed it 30, 30 year old 30 year old pete could have yeah. fucking crushed that you kidding me i'm 30 years Little old <laughs> I, I, he's way smarter <laughs> He knows like, he actually probably didn't know it. Like, mean, who knows that? If he but... wanted to fight over it, I probably could have kicked his ass too. Yeah. <laughs> we got fun facts here. He could have he could have rattled, he could have been like, Did you know that uh initially David Vogel, the president of uh the production at Disney, saw something in M. Night Shyamalan's script and he bought it despite his stipulation that Shyamalan direct and then he got fired? Tom Cruise is like this kid is older than me right now. Why? <laughs> I want to see. You know how they have like in like um, Judd Apatow movies at the end, they have like the super cut of, yeah. of just like the riffing on the jokes. Yeah. And I want to see like a super cut of Jonathan Lipnicki just reciting like outrageously long fun yeah. facts. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of like, do you know the human head weighs eight pounds? Do you know that initially uh, Christina Aguilera's part in uh, Lady Marmalade was supposed to be sung by Pink, but uh, they demanded that she sing it. So then there was a feud between Christina Aguilera and Pink and everything was all fine and they let cooler heads prevail but then Christina Aguilera used Linda Perry to write uh, Beautiful and that had been Pink's co-writer so then it caused a rip between Linda Perry and Pink no and like, I didn't that's know that it. this is fascinating this, oh, that's, that was just like an example <laughs> yeah. of a long fun fact but 
Yeah, that's Thank true. Thank you, Jonathan Lipnicki. My favorite all- kinds of my favorite kinds of fun facts. With no breaths in between, you have to deliver it like <laughs> soliloquy. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, while we're on the on the the twist of this movie, how is the twist of this movie not that that mother was just poisoning her child? I know Misha Barton that she I, was poisoning. Yeah, her. I did not remember that part of this movie at all. Munchausen by proxy, I believe, is that, what that is. That happened, and I was like, "What? Yeah, holy, yeah." yeah. You know what? That's one of the great scenes because, like, it was one of those things where it's like Sixth Sense. It's a classic movie, but like in rewatching it for this podcast, there are all these things that are profound that you don't remember. And then, like, when he hands over the the uh, wooden box with the cassette tape in it, I was like, "Oh yeah, like what's on that cassette tape?" Like, I know it's revealing in some way. And then I was like on the edge of my seat watching that whole thing. And uh, yeah, you forget about some of those things, but that was like that's. That's a thing that I woke up this morning, a night after watching it, and then like left my stomach turning a little bit. I was like, oh yeah, like, you know, it's like like um, Sixth Sense, like where we talk about razzmatazz with Chicago. I think like Sixth Sense doesn't have the level of, of razzmatazz that maybe uh, you'd expect from a thriller, or like certainly in comparison to Chicago, but that was a razzmatazz moment. Yeah, I mean, and profound creepiness in this movie like yeah, goes without so. saying but like it, it's very well executed creepiness the uh hey want to see where my dad hides his gun scene yeah. like there Thanks are there are those that, like, yeah. there are those brief like 15 seconds like that to me is so much more impressive obviously like a jump yeah. scare i don't think is impressive well none of it all. feels cheap but none like, of it right, feels like, cheap at all it gives you like a, a sh- it's short but it's it's fucked enough that yeah. you're thinking about it as the as the movie goes on. It so feels like, like this movie has a lot of like horror homages without without ever really presenting itself as a horror movie. Yeah, like, you know what? It's it's the homages without the tropes. Right. Yeah. 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 Good way of putting it. Uh, another thing that you forget is in this because I, I feel like this is now two weeks in a row. Like we'd forgotten with uh, Jerry Maguire. We were like all of those classic lines that they say. You had me at hello. Uh, you complete me. We were like these. That that's those are back to back lines. That happens all in the same scene. And like you forget that some of the massive things that these movies pull. I fucking forgot about stuttering Stanley. Oh uh, yeah, I did. Stuttering Stanley. Stanley. Stuttering too. Stanley. Yeah. Stuttering Stanley. That was tough. He's man. troubled and a bully. Yeah, right. <laughs> he is. He's become the thing that he hates the most. Super mean. Uh, and honestly, I didn't feel this way when I was a kid watching this movie, but when he's like, Hey, don't look at me like that. It makes me feel bad. I'm like, yo, I've been there before. I know what this kid's <laughs> talking about. <laughs> <laughs> like I, you, you have to grow up a little more to, to realize it, but yeah, everyone's been in a spot where like three, four people looking at you and you're like, would I do something? What the fuck? What, what's happening? I feel terrible <laughs> right like, now. Yeah. And that's like the first scene. Like you find out that this kid has been like bullied and like tormented basically his entire life. And it's, it's really like affecting him. And you're like, well, I'm sure this kid's just like misunderstood and the kids are really mean. And then like the first interaction you actually see is him being like the biggest bully of all time. And you're like, is this kid like an asshole? Does he deserve this? He's going after the big dog. <laughs> he starts right. with the teacher. Yeah. He's like, this is how I'm going to win my classmates respect. I'm starting with you guy <laughs> that that I thought might be Donnie Wahlberg because I was waiting this whole movie for Donnie Wahlberg because in the credits it says Donnie Wahlberg. You didn't realize the first guy? I did not know that I was half hour past it. Yeah. Did you, you all knew this? I, I did not know that Donnie Wahlberg was in the movie until I saw him in the credits. And then when he first showed up, I was like, oh shit, that's Donnie Wahlberg. Oh, okay. So I guess I wasn't looking for him. I I saw this person that looks, I mean, he pulled a, uh, like a Haley Steinfeld at the Met Gala. Looks like just a <laughs> an entirely different human being. I ended up reading about like he starved himself for the role and everything. But holy smokes, Donnie Wahlberg. I mean, good for him. Like that's commitment. I would not starve myself for like the first 30 seconds of the sixth sense. You would probably have to starve yourself to play a little kid. That's you have true. To, you, gotta, you gotta get those muscles off or something, <laughs> at least. Do a little cardio. Yeah. <laughs> just like going to sauna for a really long time yeah. with a book of long-winded fun facts. <laughs> And you're fucking ready to go. I will say, Sean, like of all the people that I thought mu- that had the best chance of being on Hot Ones uh, from these movies, I because I thought there were like two or three people that, that could have been on by now. I was like, oh, there's no way that Donnie Wahlberg hasn't sat in for a wing or two. 
I think no, yeah, Wahlberg we haven't had Donnie, we haven't had any Wahlbergs. I, I, you know, and Mark, you know, being from Boston, I, you guys can tell me, but like, I, Mark Wahlberg is on my like white whale list of uh, of potential guests. Like, uh, I'm I'm endlessly fascinated by that guy. Oh yeah, and he, I feel like he would, uh, he'd have a lot of stuff to say. I yeah. feel yeah. If, if if he were on Hot Ones, he'd be he'd have a lot of things to say. You'd have to do minimal guiding would be yeah. my guess i, I just want to see I, how tough he would act because yeah, i feel I like he would be that. and i'm curious about the diet restrictions or like when would we have to shoot this thing at 5 45 a.m right, his schedule. Where, like yeah in between that, like, his like four rounds of golf that somehow yeah. take 15 minutes <laughs> and doing this show that's my favorite part of it is like because it's this like budget uh public access 80s kind of set you know like we travel all over the place you mm -hmm. kind of end up walking a mile in somebody else's shoes and then sometimes even when you shoot the shows like living in their world so i wonder what that like mark Wahlberg thing i wonder how dp rolls i wonder where we'd have to shoot i wonder at what time i'm sure there'd be like baked wings with like this sort of you know what i mean like i'm sure there'd be like lots of knobs that we have to turn that we don't usually have to turn so i'm like endlessly fascinated and, and living for the mark Wahlberg day when it eventually comes so you're being like us with this movie with these movies where the pre-production is as interesting as yeah. Yeah. actually executing it like you want the experience of i've had him on versus like i interviewed him that's you know what there's almost more insight in that than there is in the actual interview sometimes you know what i mean like those are oh yeah those are the things i'll take to the grave but I, like uh yeah those are the little observations and insights into somebody's world that uh i treasure well, yeah, well a, a lot of it i mean like in a regular interview it's about what they give to you but like right. you're allowed to take from them in like the experience of it yes 100 percent uh a great line from this other than uh did you think the play sucked big time i loved that that was so good that, that those words were uttered uh Haley joel osmond asks asks uh bruce willis you wigging out yeah that was and i was like <laughs> he said what <laughs> he asks him you just he doesn't say like hey are you wigging out are you like hey is everything okay says you wigging out and i forget what bruce willis says back because i would just like i wrote like five paragraphs of notes after that but that is a <laughs> that is a hilarious line and there are lots of those and you know i even thought like in the suck big time you know one of my favorite parts of the sixth sense is like when they're talking about how the kid who was in that play did a commercial and then they yeah. actually played the commercial you know and was like showing his depth as an actor you know I, I thought actually like on a sort of uh adding some levity to that show a little space for it to breathe a little uh comic relief i thought that was brilliant yeah uh we're, so we talked about how much we liked chicago how much did we like the sixth sense because I think I prob I loved it and I considered it great, classic, whatever you want to call it, for years having seen it once. I did not enjoy it and was not as blown away the second time I saw it. No, I thought that it was still really, really good. And I thought that like it was shot really well. It was obviously performed really well. I liked the like the entire aesthetic of the way that it was presented. I liked the horror homages. I liked uh, I, I, for some reason, the one that has the, the scene that has always really stuck out to me is the one on the spiral staircase uh, yep. with that little um, the little like whatever laundry door, mm -hmm. little thing, closet, yeah, little closet for that was like the creepiest thing for me growing up. Just like the claustrophobicness of being stuck in there. Oh, yeah. And then like looking up at the spiral staircase with the balloon going up to the ceiling like that really seems like a like a the shining esque horror shot. And I thought that was awesome. And I, I really like this movie, even seeing how not subtle it is in places. That's really what, what bothered me on the second watch or the third watch or whatever this was. It's just like, I feel like they over explained it in a lot of different areas and they sort of like spoon fed you where they didn't need to. They zoomed in on Bruce Willis's fate. They, when he says, I see dead people, it zooms in on Bruce Willis's face really? and they considered reshooting that. But I think uh, Shyamalan was like, no, nah, they're not going to get it. <laughs> like, but know, that, that's so squid game where it's like they're handing it to you and you're like, fuck, I just didn't take it. Yeah. <laughs>
And then you know what, Pete? It's uh, I love that you brought up that spiral stair staircase and the in the closet because that's that's a thing again that I remember as being like so creepy. But then when I watched it again, and and here's what I'll say. Let me preface this all by saying we're doing an 86 percent episode here, and there's a reason that these things are 86 percent. Like these are both unimpeachably excellent movies by every standard. So we're Heavy going hitters. in it with that with that with that this is not a 57 percent episode this is not a 33 percent episode you know what i'm saying like we're talking about two excellent movies but you know I, and maybe this is me just being a farm animal maybe this is me just being a popcorn eating half an edible watching sort of basic kind of bitch guy. yeah basic <laughs> ass bitch but like when i was watching it you know when we when they had that closet scene i was like what's going on in the closet? Like, I want to see what's going on in the closet. Like this guy who's talking, it's a voice. I get that that's creepy. I want to fucking see him. You know what I mean? Like, I want to see what this guy looks like. I want to see how he's confronting uh, Haley Joel Osment in this fucking closet. Like, I want to see all of those things, but we're outside of the closet the entire time. So when I was watching it, I think like the, like I said, the razzmatazz of Chicago, I was so cranked up. I think in who I've become as a cinephile, and who I've become as a movie watcher casually in my life. The razzmatazz was cranked so high in Chicago, I actually felt like there was some room to crank it in uh, the sixth sense where maybe it wasn't. I'm not a filmmaker. I'm not a film critic. Maybe that makes this all dumber and worse or whatever. Like I said, I preface this all by saying I'm a farm animal, but I want it in that closet. I want yeah, to see what was going on. I want to see the face behind that voice. That's interesting because I, I feel the like the exact opposite. Like I feel like it, it sort of leaves you a little bit detached and, and like from an outsider perspective looking at this kid wondering what's wrong with him and like like again i feel like they over explained it in in a lot of ways and and sort of like force fed it to you this was one of the ways that i feel like they didn't and i appreciated that like it yeah, kind yeah. of left a little room between you and and sort of what was happening yeah, and I guess it's that diversion of opinion that makes this podcast what it is, and like this conversation what it is, and and uh, movie watching just in general, and discussions about it what it is is that diversion of opinion. But yeah, I think it's just the the farm animal in me that like I, I wanted more blood in that. I wanted to sink my teeth into more of that. Yeah, you want to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. And that's what the great movies do. I mean, with Chicago, you have people saying, well. I think he did deserve to get shot for blowing a bubble. And then you got the group, the classic group that thinks that maybe he didn't. it's maybe 2021. He... You always have to present two sides. Exactly. Yeah. So the, these are, as you said, Sean, like real heavy hitters. Well, well-rounded. We've only done mid eighties. Yeah. We we're only so two, far. Last week was 84, 84. And there's a dynamite matchup coming up. We really want to do that is 79, but we got to get into, I think that when we put this idea out there, people were like, Oh, so they'll only do like 33s and those are going to be a lot of fun, but you should do, you should do like 30, you should do uh thirties Fridays or something like that. Yes. Theme, <laughs> themed weeks. Hell yes. yeah. I like that. Yeah. Uh, so w which of these two do we feel is better? And uh, obviously there's, this is the most arbitrary thing in the world, but it's more about the discussion than the result. Yep. I think I had more fun. Obviously, one's more fun than the other, but I was left uh, with Chicago having made a better impression on me than The Sixth Sense. All right, I'll go. Uh, I'll go second. I I'm gonna go Sixth Sense because I I mean like I thought Chicago was a really good time, um, and again like a lot of what I saw I I liked and I thought that was a a like a fantastic production and like a spectacle. Um, but I think I got to give points to like the sixth sense for how iconic it is in like the category in terms of being like a, uh, just like a, a, a basically like a tentpole thriller in the history of cinema. Yeah. And landmark. And so like I don't want to take too much off because of my complaint about the twist and how how sort of delivered it was because we are 20 years into knowing what this movie is about yeah. and you know it had the impact that it did for a reason at the time and so like I, I don't think that it's a perfect movie and and I, I outside of like the twist and and like the lack of subtle subtlety uh, I, I would say that my biggest complaint is that it feels a little bit rushed at the end like it feels like there's a really slow climb through like the first two thirds 
And then once they arrive at like things getting in motion, it kind of blows by it. Like somehow this kid is, is like healed by helping one ghost. And, you know, I, I felt like it kind of breezed through the end, but other than that, I still really, really enjoyed it upon like the second look. And I think that it holds a bigger impact to me and to like film than Chicago. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. There's no question that there's no question there. Like, obviously, the sixth sense is more important and made a greater mark than Chicago made. Tell you what, though, if I'm popping on one of these movies, give me those songs. (laughs) <laughs> all right i guess i'll break the tie here and i can't argue with anything that you guys just said upon watching six cents the next time around and you know even sometimes you wonder in this this era that we're living in like this sort of uh mcu universe thing that we're living in where i think there are fewer movies made these days that are like the six cents that are like chicago i think studios are less likely to take risks like you said with my guy spending three million you know like that probably <laughs> never happens again it's like kenny lofton would never make it to the majors these days right. because he doesn't hit enough home runs like these are kenny lofton kind of caught in a time warp movie things but maybe that was like the best era of cinema of our lives you know what i mean and i think that both of these are crowning achievements chicago i'd never watched before six cents i would obviously watch before six cents in watching it I, I was struck by the shot struck by the beauty struck by the way that it was just stretched out into a nice pizza dough it wasn't just trying to hit those notes all the time like chicago does and shots are beautiful the performances are amazing it's creepy it's it's the thing that you wake up the next day and you're thinking about it and it's still fucking with your mind a little bit and sixth sense does all of those things uh even knowing the twist even having experienced it 20 years ago and knowing exactly what's going to happen but like i said this is where i've fallen into as a movie watcher where i'm a popcorn guzzling half an edible (laughs) i need I need the You're now up to one and a half edibles, by the way, over the course of this. You're you're chipping away half at a time. I need the dubstep drop on my movie (laughs) these days. You know what I mean? And Chicago has that in full. So I, I had a more enjoyable experience watching Chicago for the first time than I did watching Sixth Sense the third time for the purposes of this podcast. And I want to give extra points to Chicago because I walked in with the preconceived notion that of course six cents is going to dunk on Chicago. Same. I walked away going, eh, I don't know. And for that reason, I have to give in this horse race where it's going nose, 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 nose at the finish line. I'm going to give it to Chicago. Homer. Wow. What a fucking Homer. Oh my God. <laughs> Trash. <laughs> yeah. Should have seen it coming. <laughs> that was more telegraphed than this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my, I'll tell you what, I was on the edge of my seat that whole, that was like the bad, if you said, we'll be right back while you were leading up to it, I would have been like, fuck yeah, we will yeah, we'll be right back. Like, cause I, no, I don't in, know where you go. The, in the show tune drama of it all. You know what I mean? Like I'm over here, I'm Richard Gere, just dancing, dancing to conclude the podcast over I, here. I so agree with you though, that like a big reason why Chicago gets a lot of points with me is that. This seemed like a pretty obvious yeah, bloodbath. I'm bath. stunned. I'm yeah. stunned that that the sixth sense is going to lose. Wow, unbelievable. But I mean, that just that again. That's why you play the game? That's yeah. why you play the game. That's right. Yeah, Heim Bloom over here just wants to <laughs> toss together a bunch of nerd teams. Computer, computer movie. <laughs> yeah, movie beep boop boop Pete over here. <laughs> well, this has been an excellent uh, tomato fights, Sean. Thank you for finally coming again. Definitely not your fault that yeah, you it's on been you on. guys. And it's, it's very, you. it's very cool that for Mostly years you me. were willing to come on. Uh, <laughs> so we appreciate it. All right, anytime. Please have me back on. Uh, give me when you guys do the first thirty special. Give me on. Oh hell yeah! Fuck yeah! <laughs>